All right, we're here uh, with a uh, special guest today. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director for District 5. We've got San Diego County Supervisor Jim Desmond, a special guest here today, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Dr. Jay is with uh, the Hoover Institute, Stanford University, all sorts of things. And, and that was kind of my first question uh, to your doctor is kind of if, if you could paint a brush of how you got involved in COVID and kind of where, where you are in that realm. Sure. Well, I've been doing work on on uh, epidemiology uh, and infectious disease epidemiology uh, for 20 years. I've worked worked on HIV. I worked on H1N1. Uh, I got involved with COVID partly because when I saw the uh, the initial numbers come out of China and the death rates, I I realized I, I remembered back to the H, during the H1N1 epidemic. There was a there was a at the initial days of it a lot of concern that the death rates were very very high. And I noticed what happened in H1N1 was that a lot of the, a lot of the focus on those death rates were, were based on tests of whether the virus was active in you, not, not whether you had the virus. Uh, because it turns out H1N1, most people just recover from it. That's true for COVID as well. And most, of, most people that recover, get it, don't get tested. And uh, it, it turned out after the fact in H1N1, the, the, the initial estimates of the de death rates were like, you know, 1%, 2%, very, very high. Uh, after you've realized how many people actually had had it and had a very mild illness from it, it turned out the death rate was 0.01% for H1N1, very, very low. And I figured, okay, maybe that's true for COVID also. Um, and that's how I got involved. I mean, I, so I've worked on, on, a, uh, on a series of, of studies just to measure how extensive the spread of the disease is. And it turns out to be way more extensive than you, you can tell just looking at the number of cases. Cases are people who get the disease because, and they get tested because they have a severe form of the disease. But there's a wide range of clinical presentations of the disease from not that, not that severe. In fact, about half the cases are completely asymptomatic to, to, to the deadly viral pneumonia we see in the, in the news, right? Um, so uh, that's, that's, that, that's what led me is, that, is, this, is my wor earlier work with H1N1 or, or my earlier sort of tracking of the H1N1 epidemic. Do you mind, uh, tell us about the studies you have done, because uh, I think that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the, the name I first heard you about with some of these studies. Sure. So uh, I've done three uh, studies to measure the, it's called the seroprevalence, the, 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 how many people show evidence of having antibodies in the population of H1N, of, of, H1N, of, of COVID. Um, uh, you know, and it, uh, so one in Santa Clara County, one in LA County, and one for the Major League Baseball population, uh, employee population. Um, in each case, we found uh, some, it's like in Santa Clara and LA County, we found in early April, there were 40 to 50 times more cases of people with evidence of having had the, the virus uh, infection than the cases would, would have led you to believe, which meant the death rate was way lower, something like 0.2%, uh, two in a thousand. Rather than you know three three point four percent or or thirty four in a thousand, which you would, with the early days would we would have expected, um, and then uh, the MLB population we did it, it's nationwide. I mean, in some sense, right? So I mean, we found a prevalence of about 0.7 percent, which is still higher than the number of cases, but uh, still lower than the surrounding counties, which you might expect in a in a population of people who are mostly these are employees, not the baseball players themselves, working from home uh, through Zoom calls like this one. Well, <clears throat> Doctor, the, uh, it seems to be <clears throat> the focus is now on the number of cases. And, I, I, and, and, it, and there has, has been an, an uptick in the number of deaths as well. You know, not dramatically, but um, it seems that, you know, cases, cases, cases is, is the even, you know, the shutdowns here in the state of California by the governor. You, you, we've got a, if we have 100 or more uh, positives per 100,000 is causing shutdowns and even shutdowns in our schools and things like that. You know, can you, to me, you know, we're kind of chasing different numbers instead of the whole picture. Just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on, on the, I guess, more the doubling of increases of cases and what, what that really means is to the society and how we should protect ourselves. The, the rise in the number of cases, the wrong metric to track. The, the number of cases is a function of the, the how much testing we're doing, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a function of obviously how widespread the, the disease is. The number of cases is an underestimate of the number of, of the actual number of infections. Most people who get the disease don't show up for, because they don't have any symptoms. 
the utmost, half, like say half the people. That's what every single antibody study that I've looked at says. Um, so tracking the number of cases is the wrong metric to decide whether to open up or close up. But the disease, in some sense, we have to learn to live with. It's just like any other viral condition. Um, and we don't close our close the whole world on the basis of the, the the number of flu cases, for instance, or the number. Now it's a deadly disease, so protecting older populations, people with comorbid conditions, is an absolute vital, uh, vital, uh, vitally important priority. If you look at the number of deaths per case, even identified case, that's declined very sharply. In San Diego County, is tracking the numbers. It's declined there. It's declined all across the country. Why is that? Uh, I think there's two reasons. One is we're actually doing a pretty good job of protecting the older population. Unlike say in New York, where uh, you saw this uh, spread in nursing homes, I think in California, we're doing a pretty good job of protecting the nursing homes. Um, and, and I think that's, that is the place where the deaths happen. If you, if you have uh, mm -hmm. outbreaks. So it's not the number of cases, it's who's getting the cases that matters. And what we, what we have is younger people getting the cases and, and dying at much, much lower rates because they don't die from this disease at the same rates as, high, uh, as older populations do. Well, one of the things we see in San Diego County is our, you know, our median age for deaths has actually gone up. It used to be 78, now it's 79. And then our median age for positive cases now, it used to be in the 60s, age, age 60 group. Now it's down to 38. So it seems like a lot more, a lot of the people who are healthier or don't have the underlying conditions are getting, uh, you know, are testing positive now for the disease. And, it, you know, to me, you know, that group is actually has a better chance of fighting and, and you know, being, uh, you know, getting through the disease instead of, you know, dying from the disease. I think that's exactly right, Jim. I mean, I think yeah. you don't, you know, you can't, um, I, I think people have a false uh, notion in their head that this uh, that we can actually eradicate this disease that we can actually stay completely safe from the disease where it just goes away somehow if we just hunker down and stay in no lockdown in history has ever eradicated a disease all it does is it pushes the peak later on that's the, that's what you're buying and it put, it'll push the peak to a time when we're poorer and less able to deal with it because the lockdown has enormous negative economic effects um, so the, the, the policy uh, that we follow right now is a policy designed to delay the onset of the disease. Of the disease. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, in some sense, that policy has failed because uh, you're seeing the rise in cases. But the rise in cases among the young, if, if you accept the premise that we're not going to eradicate the disease uh, in any, anytime soon, or actually probably never, uh, this is something we're going to have to live with. Um, if, the, if you accept that premise, which I, I think is true, I mean, it, it seems incontrovertible to me, uh, then, then who should get the disease? Like, it's, it, if a, a younger population that, that, uh, that dies at much, 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 much lower rates, that seems like the right, and you're seeing the death rate from this. It's, in fact, it's less of a, a, a for younger populations, let, let's say people under 20, I think there's been, I mean, vanishingly few deaths in even California yeah. since the start of the epidemic. Uh, for, for younger people. And, and so what's, what's the end point? The end point is some kind of herd immunity. There's really no other way out. How do we know when we've reached herd immunity? I, what, I don't even know what that, what is that metric? I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I think what you see a, 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 a classic epidemiologic pattern where the, the, the disease spreads and then it stops spreading. You go, you scratch your head and say, why, why is it stop spreading? It's because enough people in the population have got the disease and uh, are, are no longer susceptible to it, um, such that a person that's positive that randomly interacts with someone in the population spreads it to a very sm small number of people. That's what her immunity means. So, like, I ha say I had, I'm, I'm not, I haven't had it, but like, say I had it uh, and I randomly run into people, I would infect on average fewer than one person, and then the disease doesn't spread. Right? Just, I just I, I, I spread it to one person, they spread it to one person, the disease sort of has a low level endemic spread uh, uh, that just stays forever. I mean, that's, what's, that's what colds are like, that's what basically almost every other virus uh, that's similar to this, to this is like. Um, is, 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 is now, of course, COVID is more deadly for some populations. That's why I keep emphasizing you have to protect the, the older population. You have to protect the people with comorbid conditions. That's absolutely vital. So um, actually, it's interesting the the rise in um, in 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 uh, the the age of the 
hospitalized population, right? You said the, 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 the now that's interesting because th that's actually pretty steady, right? Yeah. So the people that are mm -hmm. getting it and going in the hospital are the same people that got it earlier. There's not that many of them, but because we're, we're doing a good job protecting the older population, but the set of people who get it and don't go to the hospital, well, they're younger, much, much younger. That's good news to me. Yeah. Well, and then schools now is the latest news from the governor, you know, reclose or, you know, putting more restrictions on in existing businesses. You know, personally, I think bars was a stretch when we opened up the bars and, and, um, <clears throat> and now we've had to pull back on that, but now the schools, the schools and kids at school, and that's going to upset the, you know, parents going back to work and things like that. So I don't know, do you have thoughts on, on school age? I mean, I pretty much can imagine because <clears throat> school age kids are not getting or the disease or not, or not feeling the negative effects of the disease. They may get it, but they, you know, they get over it pretty quick. Have you got any thoughts on schools and, and that effort now that they all have to be just as an absolutely fast fascinating study that was published in the New England Journal uh, in, out of Iceland. Um, they, they, they sampled uh, the virus in a rep representative set of the population. I think like they got 12 or 15 percent of the population, very large for, for percentage of the population. They just they, they took the, the nose swab and checked. Um, and every single positive case, they sequenced the genome of the virus. And so for, just, to, just to give you a sense, like suppose I had the virus and I, I, my genome had of the virus had mutation A in it. And let's say you had the virus and your genome had the virus, your genome had mutation A and B. Well, that, that means I might have passed the virus to you because mutations happen randomly, right? So you have mutation B on top of A and B, but you probably didn't pass the virus to me. On the basis of that, what they found was that there was not one case in Iceland of a child passing the, the virus to an adult. Really? Not a <clears throat> single case. Um, children seem to have a, very, a prote protective immunity from the virus that, that, that reduces the, the rate of spread, even if they are infected. Um, on this basis and on, on similar studies around the world, uh, schools have opened every, almost everywhere except in the United States. Uh, you know, the, the schools have reopened in, in, in uh, um, uh, Denmark, they've reopened in Sweden, they've reopened uh, in France, they've reopened in Germany, uh, in many places with absolutely no restrictions whatsoever on the basis of the scientific evidence. Um, I don't understand why the schools are not reopening here. The evidence, the scientific evidence supports school reopening. As we all know also, we are, if you don't have schools open, I mean, the, the online, I'm, I'm sure the teachers have done a, a, as, as good a job as possible under, this, under these situations to try to get the, to replace the schooling online, but they're really, as we all know, no substitute for in-person school. Like how do you, how do you teach a first grader online? It's, yeah. it's just gonna be a very difficult thing. I mean, you have to have the schools open and the science supports it. Well, I'm gonna let Miles take this back for a bit, but I do have, I guess, a couple of questions after, after that. Our biggest pushback, and I've been <clears throat> on the news down here in San Diego County as an advocate for opening up the schools, and the biggest pushback has been, well, those kids are going to go home, they're going to go to their families, and they're going to, you know, sit on grandma and grandpa's lap, or they're going to interact with grandma and grandpa, and, and those are the people we need to be protecting. So how do you justify that? And you, and you said they rarely, the younger people very uh, rarely yeah, yeah, like spread this disease. For young kids, uh, there's no evidence whatsoever of transmission to, to parents or to adults. Um, now, older kids, it's a different question, right? So that there, I think you do have to, I mean, you, you mentioned at the beginning, how to reopen safely. There, you want to make sure people have good information, right? So if you have older kids in the house, uh, you want to make, sh make sure the grandparents that are, are have, have chronic conditions understand that they may be at risk, right? So it's not like you can do this completely. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's, it, you know, it's still a very dangerous disease, right? So we have to remind, remember, remember that. But at the same time, it's dangerous not to. Re it's not. It's dangerous not to have schools. It's it's the kind of thing that lasts generations. The cost that we that, that our kids will pay will, will will reverberate through generations. A year of schooling lost is an, an enormous thing, um, and, and it it too has public health consequences. So I, I think it's not a question here of let's keep safe. There is no safe option here. We we have to we have to do our best to try to protect the people that are vulnerable in the context of trade offs. Hmm. Doctor, is, is someone, this is kind of a, I've been thinking about this question because we've had these conversations with other folks in your field. You study these viruses, not maybe this obviously specific one, but things like this every year. You're looking, I'm sure there's things that don't make it into the public. And now obviously there's like a microscope on COVID. 
as you sit back and, and nobody's saying this isn't a big deal at all. In fact, you're talking about it's a very big deal, especially to those most vulnerable. But do you sit back and you go, you know, why this one? Like, like, like there were things two years ago, three years ago. I'm just kind of on a broader, like a bigger picture. Do you, do you wonder that? I mean, I think, you know, it's, it, uh, you saw the pictures out of China, out of, out of, uh, out of Italy, uh, now New York. Um, you know, it is, it, it has dramatic effects and anything like this that has such dramatic effects on, 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 on an unidentified population will, will catch the public's imagination. And, you know, and I think in the early days where you saw those, it almost looked like a video game, a map with the red dots get spreading. Uh, I mean, it just ca it caught everyone's imagination for some, for, and, you know, in the early days, the death estimates were so high. If the death estimates were right, the early death estimates were right, it's really 3.4%. That really does, it does justify not just what we did, but even more. I mean, that is an absolutely deadly, and we knew very little about the immunity around it. There was a lot of uncertainty. I, I don't begrudge the attention, the early attention. We now know a lot more about the disease, and I, that and now we don't have too much of an excuse, right? We need to understand what the science is actually saying and, and, and act on it. And I think a lot of the the panic from the early days has not subsided in the way I expected, given what the, given what we've learned so far about the seeds. What is what is an end end look like? Is it that herd immunity? I know you kind of touched on, but what is you know? I think everybody can't see the finish line at this point. What does that look like? It's herd immunity. There's no other way. I mean, you can you there are now there are several vaccines in trial, um, and uh, I hope they work. But there is and there's some early evidence that they, that they're producing some some effects in in small studies. Um, well, let's let's keep our fingers. Cause that's because that also is a mechanism for herd immunity, right? So widespread vaccination that for vaccine that's safe and effective. Mm -hmm. So one of one of those two endpoints. I've got one last question, but uh, Jim, did you have one? Anything else? Yeah. <clears throat> and <clears throat> doctor, if you're not comfortable with this, let me know. It just seems, <clears throat> you know, the governor, and, and if you don't want to get political in this, this is fine. But you would think he's got you know, people like yourself and epidemiologists and everything else helping him make decisions. And yet we're coming out with these, I guess, more draconian type answers to or, or to, the, to the virus to where we're shutting down schools and, and things like that. I mean, you seem very factual and you, want to, and you stick to, do you have any idea why, you know, he's doing that or why, why we're getting, or we have this split in, in uh, of of what you know of shutting down the schools versus not shutting down the schools, or you know focusing on protecting the elderly and and you know just not necessarily ignoring the number of cases, but knowing that that's okay. In any idea why the governor would be you know taking this other path? In the, I, I, mean, I shouldn't speak specifically for the governor. I'll just say my general observations about the the the. I mean, you're 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 in the political realm, so you you, you I'm sure you face this directly. Yeah. Um, like it's it to me it's a it's a cost benefit. I mean, I'm an economist, you know, so I, I I always think this way. It's a cost benefit. So if I if I make a, a call and say, okay, let's let's reopen, and cases jump up, deaths jump up, you face a, an enormous risk. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to make that call, because you face this uncertainty. Yes. Um, if I make the call that I'm going to close down everything, well, okay, lockdowns are effective in in slowing the spread. Uh, that's what they're for. Uh, I mean, they don't eliminate disease, but they'll, sp they'll slow the spread. Uh, and the costs, which is kids not going to school, uh, people not taking their kids to get vaccinated, uh, people who, don't, who, who are with cancer not getting, getting uh, chemotherapy because they're scared of COVID, all those costs are under the radar screen and you don't face them. You just mm -hmm. can point to the, the, the oh, look, we, su we successfully suppressed the number of cases for the, for the time being. Uh, so the political calculus... And I've, I've seen this not just with the governor, but nationwide is in, in the direction of let's stay safe from the, from the political perspective. For most, pol for most folks who in, are in politics, that seems like the safer option because the yeah. costs well, are so visible. If you you know the, the newspaper is filled with the number of cases rising, um, but they're not filled with the number of people uh, who uh, who would have gotten a good education but won't, and or, and, t and ten years from now, twenty years from now. They can't get a job because they don't. They, they're not as well. Their human capital is is crushed. Uh, it's not filled with 
you know, all of the hidden costs of the disease, which are absolutely enormous, of the lockdowns, which are absolutely right. enormous. Well, and I've been trying to find a balance to say, okay, we got to live with it. How do we open up safely and keep, you know, like you say, keep our elderly, you know, safe as much as we possibly can, but we have to live with it. And there's no such thing as being completely 100% safe. You've got to, we've got to continue on with life and, and protect as many people as we possibly can, but not shutting down the economy is, is, uh, is to me, is a terrible option by actually shutting it down. So I don't know, Miles, did you have something you wanted to wrap up? Yeah, with? so this is kind of the last question that I ask all, all the guests that we talk to, Doctor, is what, what's some hope for folks? You know, here we are on a Monday, and maybe they look at the headline in the paper, and they see the spikes casing, or, or they're worried about their, their mom or their parent or whomever. What, what, what are kind of some, what, what should people look for? Give them some hope as well. I mean, I, 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 actually, I see a lot of cause for hope. Um, so I mentioned uh, the, the the spread of the disease in younger population. I mean, that, I think that's all else, based on what's possible. That's good news. Um, I mean, obviously, I'd wish that the disease weren't here, but that's not possible. Uh, but also, we have a lot better treatment, right? So in the early days of the disease, we were using ventilators in a way that were that were that high, that produced high death rates, and we're much better at that now. So if you if you have a severe version of it, we're better at treating you. We have, we're using. Um, steroids in a way to prevent the cytokine storm that would kill people. Uh, we're, we, we are much better at treating the disease than we were. And that's also a reason why the death rates have come down. If you ignore the case, if you, if you, if you, if you just pay attention to the cases, you're going to ignore the good news, which is the death rates from the disease have plummeted, but in part because who's getting it, but also in part because we're much better at treating it. Mm. Well, that's good. That's good news. I think we're closer to the end than, than one might, one might think. Good. Well, doctor, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your wisdom. Uh, Supervisor, any, any last words? Well, I, I just want to say thank you very much. You know, it's <clears throat> trying to be factual and rational and, and how do we best deal and live with it, I think is the best approach. And, and I really appreciate your, uh, your input and your time today, doctor. Um, I appreciate your political courage trying to, trying to like do this trade-off. I mean, I wish more politicians would do that. Well, thank you. <laughs>